Welcome NISAC members and guests, and thank you for joining us today for another session of our virtual NISAC legislative conference. Uh, this is Patrick Cummings, counsel at NISAC. Um, you're joining uh, policing policies in 2021 and beyond. Uh, we do have 10 separate uh, workshops covering a wide variety of topics this week, and we hope you can attend as many as possible. Uh, before we start, Jeanette, uh, any housekeeping that we need to clarify at this time? Yes, Pat. Good afternoon, everybody. Just a couple of small points. We will be recording the program today, and we will post that recording tomorrow morning on the NISAC website with a PDF of the slides. You can find this um, posting tomorrow morning at www.nisac.org backslash education. Um, also, we ask that you type in your questions through the dashboard under the questions tab in writing during the program if you have any questions. We will uh, do a QA and a at the very end and we'll read and hopefully get to everybody's questions um, before we sign off. Patrick, where's yours? Thank you, Jeanette. Um, we'll get underway in one moment, but we do want to first thank our sponsor for this session, Zen City. Uh, we are uh, thankful for their support and helping us inform and educate hundreds of county officials from across the state. And we'd like to share a message from them now. Thank you so much and thank you for having us. I personally am super proud to support NISAC and the important work of counties in New York and around the country. We at Zen City, as a company, serve only the local government sector. And today I'm proud to say we partner with over 200 counties and cities across the country, including Riverside County, California, uh, and Sarasota County in Florida. Our main goal is to help leaders like you make better decisions by really understanding the needs and priorities of the communities that you serve. We know that you spend your days serving your communities in the best way possible. But one of the challenges is really understanding and prioritizing what does my community need the most? And our goal is to let you hear the real voice of the community that you serve. We do that by aggregating data from a lot of different sources like social media, Facebook and Twitter, like your own customer service data, like 211, 311 or emails that you're getting and from online media. And we loop in all of that data and with some advanced AI, advanced machine learning, we turn that into structured numbers and scores that really show you what's going on and what is the lay of the land in terms of your community's priorities. Over the past year, we work closely with our county partners through some of the most difficult times in public safety and community relationships. Our main goal is to help counties, help sheriff's offices, really increase trust between the communities that they serve and their agencies. The way we do that is that we help these organizations better understand the driving factors behind their community's sentiment, whether positive or negative, and really help hear um, an unfiltered voice from a wide range of members of your community. As we think about the topic of this upcoming session about Governor Cuomo's um, police reform initiative, a lot of it is about listening to the community and making sure that we align our decisions and our work with the needs and priorities and expectations that the community has. And that is exactly what we've did over the last uh, several months uh, and, and all the turmoil that was part of it. For example, we helped our customers in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, understand sentiment around body cams and how to better align messaging to increase trust and use that as an opportunity to come together as a community. So overall, we help our counties, whether address misinformation or is it uh, uh, understanding what are some of the specific concerns that they have so that agencies can do a better job increasing people's um, sense of safety and trust in their local law enforcement. So we just opened our first New York office and we'd be thrilled to partner with all the incredible counties that are part of NISAC. We think that you do some of the most important work in the country right now. Um, and if we can be a partner, especially around initiatives like uh, the governor's police reform initiative, we'd love to be there to support your work. Um, our goal is to really provide an unfiltered uh, view of the voice of your community to inform people like you, leaders in the county space, uh, county admins, sheriff's offices, uh, and help you make better decisions. So if there's any way that we can support your important work, please don't hesitate to reach out as we'd love to partner.
Now it's my pleasure to introduce NISAC President, Honorable Jack Marin of Ontario County, who will be introducing our keynote speakers. Well, thank you, Patrick. And I want to uh, thank everyone for participating here today. And I want to thank uh, certainly our special guest speakers for their time and their busy schedule. So our special guest speakers today in this order, we'll start with Carly S. Bolanos, partner, Bolanos Low L -B -P -L -L -C. For almost two decades, Carly Bolanos has helped county government employers navigate the complexities of local government law issues. Carly earned, the, earned rank within the 2020 edition of Best Lawyers in the Area of Labor Law Management. Carly has helped multiple counties navigate through the Executive Order 203 process, and she will share this knowledge with us today. Our second speaker, Ava Ayers, Director of Government Law Center, Albany Law School. Prior to her career at Albany Law School, Ava Ayers graduated first in her class from Georgetown Law in 2005. She then clerked for the Honorable Sonia Sotomayor, now a United States Supreme Court Justice, during her term on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Additionally, Ava worked for nine years in the office of the New York Attorney General, where she was a Senior Assistant Solicitor General. Ava serves currently on the City of Albany's Police Reform and Reinvention Task Force, and will share with us lessons from that process that will help our county strengthen our collective plans. In completing our panel will be a team of experts from New York City. We are honored to have with us today, Ariana Kaplan, who is New York City's Senior Advisor for Intergovernmental Partnerships. Ariana closely follows and advises New York City on all state related issues that impact the city. And she has been instrumental with helping us on the 203 implementation. I also have the pleasure of working with Ariana over my years as New NYSAC president, as she serves and is heavily engaged on the NYSAC board as New York City's representative. Thanks for all you do for NYSAC and for being here today, Ariana. Liz Dates is the executive director of strategic initiatives at New York PD. Prior to this current position, Liz was senior counsel for NYPD for five years, as well as serving as executive director of New York City Civil Litigation. Our third speaker is Marco Solor, is the acting director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Previous to joining New York City, Marcos was an adjunct assistant professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice of CUNY. Marcos then worked for the Civilian Complaint Review Board for the City of New York. The CCRB is the largest civilian oversight agency in the United States. The CCRB investigates, mediates, and prosecutes administrative complaints against the officers of the New York Police Department. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to our very first speaker, Carly Olamos. Thank you kindly for that introduction. Much appreciated. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. So for my, my role in the presentation, I'm going to go over some of the legal nuts and bolts of the Executive Order 203. For some of us that still have some questions about the basics and the process to unfold, before I turn it over to our organized, uh, our, our speakers who have been part of the team that have been implementing the reinvention collaborative. So I'm really excited to hear um, from those folks as well. I'm gonna share my webcam. Yep. Okay, on the next slide, by now we all know that um, the governor had issued this executive order on June 12th, 2020. And since that time, we've been working with the process to get plans in place across the state of New York, um, there's been some very exciting work going on. So the stated purpose, of course, of the executive order was to create law enforcement changes in response, of course, to the police-involved deaths and concerns about racially biased law enforcement and really to create accountability for law enforcement agencies, which is something as a management side, public sector labor lawyer I've been doing for years in terms of handling uh, what can be really difficult police discipline issues and making sure that we are 
um, identifying problems when they exist and dealing with those problems accordingly to make sure that we don't have individuals working within our police agencies who might be dangerous, sick, um, or in some other way having some type of difficulty. So just in very brief summary, if you go to the next slide, very brief sum summary is like a four-step process that I'm going to cover briefly before I turn it over to the experienced speakers on the Reinvention Collaborative. And that is first, we have to, um, as municipal entities with our police agencies and with our citizens, we have to create police reform and reinvention plans. Uh, this must allow for input and comments from the public, as I mentioned, from stakeholders that are involved in the collaborative, um, from, of course, taking it to public um, sessions to be heard. Ultimately, we have to create legislative act, act, action of some sort um, to adopt the plan. And then finally, by April 1st, as we're quickly approaching, we have to submit those plans to New York State. On the next slide, just provide you with a brief summary of those steps broken down. And the key part um, here is you've got the email address. That's our email that we must submit our certification, which I'll show you on an upcoming slide, as well as a copy of our plan to that EO203 certification at budget.newyork.gov. So that's an important piece of information for you to have. Um, if you do not submit in a timely fashion, you do run the risk of having loss of funding for your local government entity. So that it's really important to, to process these in a timely fashion. At this point in time, most municipalities have created their draft plans. A lot of them are available to view on the website. If you're on their websites, if you're looking for ideas, you can find a lot of plans online. Um, we're moving to public comment or already in the public comment period in preparation to get a lot of these plans for March legislation within the local municipalities for submission to that EO203 certification at budget.newyork.gov um, on April 1st. On the next slide, just a brief overview. Again, uh, the, the agencies that were covered were those agencies that employ police officers as that is defined in section 1.20 of the New York State Criminal Procedure Law. So just a reminder uh, regarding that piece of information. If you have any concerns about coverage, um, it's important that you um, review that now, um, speak with counsel to determine whether or not your agency needs to have uh, a reform and reinvention plan prepared. On the next slide, so I think we can gather by now, most local governments should have their plan started in full process, really moving toward the end of the process for the creation and implementation and legislation around our, our police reform plans. Um, we're really getting to that stage where we need to have legislation to submit to New York State by that April 1st deadline. Um, teams have focused across the state and spent a lot of time reviewing existing data, looking um, at er researching policy areas, best practice, gold standards, looking into the different aspects of accreditation, and overall looking for strategic improvements uh, for their police departments and agencies in order to better serve the communities in which they exist and who they, whom they serve. On the next slide, looking at development of that plan as a specific step in the Executive Order 203, it's important to remember that it's the chief executive of the municipality, um, whatever that government entity may be, really was responsible for this program. And you'll see on the certification form that you're required to submit as a municipality to the state by April 1st. It's requiring that certification from the chief executive officer, not from the chief of police or the sheriff, but from the chief executive officer of the locality. So that sort of reminds us of the executive order 203 really gave power to that chief executive to take control of the situation around the police reform within its community. And so, you know, that, that certification will become very important because it's that chief executive's name that is on that plan. So on the next slide, I've mentioned that developing the plan required um, as part of the governor's executive order, the participation of stakeholders. So these are um, individuals with whom the local government entity 
and the police agency must consult with. Um, and hopefully by now you have teams of individual stakeholders, advocates who have been part of uh, the process of planning for your reform and your re reinvention within your communities. And I think we'll be hearing from some of those folks today who have participated in such uh, civilian committees and uh, police committees to, to create and design these plans. But that stakeholder involvement was important, uh, critical in fact, in as much as on the certification that must be submitted to New York on April 1st requires um, an attestation from the chief executive that specific stakeholders uh, were worked with during the process. So that was a critical component of the plans as we understood in June when this executive order was first published. On the next slide is a very important reminder of the components, the necessary components of the plan. There's all sorts of extra components of the plan and things that communities have deemed necessary based on the conversations with the police agencies and with the stakeholders. But we have to remember that the executive order itself identified a slew of topics um, and areas that must be part of your plan. So now is an important time as, you, as you're reviewing your final draft plans to look at this list and make sure that your plan contains uh, or addresses in some way all of these areas. These were not optional requirements from the executive order. These were mandatory requirements from the executive order. So this list that we are presenting for you here is a good reminder um, to check to make sure that you're compliant with the executive order before you submit that plan to the state. It's my understanding that the state will really be utilizing the same type of checklist to make sure that the plans uh, will encompass all of these parts that were deemed key by the governor when he had enacted this executive order. So if you have any questions about those specific areas, we'd be happy to discuss those as well, but we just wanted to list those for you here as we review the nuts and bolts of the executive order. On the next slide, so remembering that public comment is also a necessary part of this legislation. Again, the chief executive officer must certify to the state that there was a public comment or co public comment periods that were available for all citizens of the location. They must have had time to review the plan, to be able to comment on the plan, and the municipality is supposed to have taken in that feedback before um, any type of legislative act was taken. So ultimately, as I've mentioned, the local legislative body in the month of March, most likely, is ratifying, adopting the plan that was developed by uh, the, the teams that worked on the Reform and Reinvention Collaborative in your community and uh, must be submitted to the state by no later than April 1st. So of course, your legislature will need to act on that at whatever meeting it has before that expiration date, before that submission date. On the next slide, the all important submission of that plan to the state. Um, so there, there's a two part process here. There is a certification form. So for those of you who have um, received copies of, most of us by now have worked with the copy of the New York State Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative Resource Guide for Public Officials and Citizens. Attachment B to that manual is a copy of a certification. That certification must be used and submitted to the email address that I had identified along with a copy of the plan. The director of the Division of Budget for New York State is going to condition your receipt of future appropriated state and federal funds um, based on the submission of the plan and likely the compliance, the inclusion of all of the required criteria from the executive order. On the next slide, I just have for you a copy of that, that manual. So if you haven't already reviewed that manual, that's an important manual on the left-hand side of the screen to have reviewed. It's attachment B that I've copied. It's very small to see, but I wanted you to just see what that appendix B looks like if you haven't already looked at it. This is the certification form that the state is expecting you to submit uh, your plan with. So it's the certification signed off. Um, by the chief executive officer. You'll see all the criteria from the executive order that are listed within that appendix B to ensure that you're in compliance with the executive order before you submit um, and before the chief executive signs off on that appendix B. And of course, the email address that that goes to with a copy of the plan. So on the next slide, in terms of the legal components of, of the 
police reform and reinvention, I think it's important to remember the say their name agenda and all of these laws that were passed um, around the same time as the executive order 203. And many of us are including within our police reform plans some type of reference here to the various uh, components of the say, say their name agenda. So for example, part of the say their name agenda was the New York State Police Body Worn Camera Program, but many of us are including body worn camera uh, programs, even pilot programs in our reinvention programs um, as part of what the state um, is interested in seeing as we move forward with our police reforms. Of course, if you didn't already have anti chokehold policies and prohibitions for officers within your community regarding any type of technique like a chokehold that you should make sure that your policies have been updated to include um, such instruction for police officers. Most of our agencies have already had those types of prohibitions within their existing policies. But if you haven't, that's something that we should see included within your police reform plan. Um, uh, addition to that, you know, policies regarding discharging of weapons, policies regarding how to react to situations um, for summoning of police officers, maybe the role of 911 with respect to the summons of police officers, um, you know, especially if it's based on a call um, where a person is describing another individual's protected characteristic and may not have a, a, a proper intent to call the police. So policies, programs, procedures that a police department might utilize to incorporate most if not all of the components of the say their name agenda into our reforms um, as part of it as well of course the repeal of 50a which allows for um, the disclosure of police disciplinary records so that's an important component as well as we think about police discipline and creating our program so that police officers can be disciplined, that we can deal with problem behavior in an appropriate and effective manner like we do for other types of employees in the public service who engage in different types of misconduct. So those are areas of the Say Their Name agenda that really relate back to police reform. And we've got um, all of the details, uh, the Senate and Assembly Bill numbers, if you need those, the effective dates of these various pieces of legislation and the details of these legislation legislations which we can provide as well if necessary. So that's really just a brief overview of the technical components of the Executive Order 203. And now I would turn it over to the panelists um, to speak about their experiences working in the actual reform. Carly, thanks so much. Um, as always, that was great information. And, and Carly will be sticking around with us. Uh, at the end, we'll do some questions and answers. I know we've already got a couple of questions that popped up. and. Um, so if you wouldn't mind sticking around and helping us when we when we get to, to that portion. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my friend, Ava Ayers. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm very grateful to the Association of Counties, um, which it's always such a great pleasure to work with. I am um, the director of the Government Law Center at Albany Law School, which is sort of a small think tank consulting firm kind of operation attached to the law school, uh, whose mission is to be useful to state and local governments um, in understanding the laws that apply to all of the various um, policy areas that they have to deal with. And one of our biggest projects this spring has been helping um, various municipalities with the implementation of the governor's executive order 203. I am um, uh, uh, a member of the collaborative, which is the fancy name for task force, that was formed in the city of Albany in response to the governor's executive order. So uh, what Pat asked me to do is talk a little bit about the experience of Albany and a little bit about um, the statewide experience and implications. So uh, let me start by just talking a little bit about um, Albany's experience. But um, but first, I, I want to thank um, Carly for her um, fantastic overview of the executive order. I think uh, there is, among the folks I speak to in different municipalities, lots of questions about the executive order and what it means. It's a very short document with very serious implications, and it creates a curious and unusual process. So there's a lot to navigate and think through. Um, I wanted to, to add just to her presentation um, that the Government Law Center 
uh, had a webinar last week, which is going to be available on our website, um, hopefully tomorrow, where a couple of folks from the governor's office talked a little bit about the executive order. One thing that they said that I found very striking was, you know, that they are looking for compliance. They're very serious about the certification. Um, there, not only um, is there a risk of state funding being taken away, but the budget bill that was proposed by the governor's office includes a proposal to appoint monitors at the discretion of the attorney general to oversee police departments in communities that don't submit a plan. So in other words, if, if a municipality doesn't submit a plan, not only are they risking state funding, they're risking the appointment of a monitor. That's discretionary, not mandatory, but obviously a very severe consequence. Um, the governor's office folks also said that they are um, reviewing plans, but not for their substance, meaning they want to see compliance with the things that are on the checklist um, that you that you saw mention of earlier. Most of those things are procedural. Uh, there has to be a certification by the municipality's executive and um, all of the different steps in the process are important. But they said, we're not going through these plans to say, oh, this is a good plan, this is a bad plan. Um, that said, I think it's worth noting that one of the conditions that have to be certified is, um, and I'm, I'm looking at that um, certification form. Now it says the local government has developed a plan to improve uh, police deployments, strategies, policies, procedures, and practices. In other words, just about every aspect of policing. So I think improve is a really important word there. Um, obviously, lots of municipalities were doing great things before the governor's executive order. We're thinking creatively about policing, we're innovating, um, and we're involving the community. But the executive order asks for a certification that there's improvements happening which I think raises the bar. No matter how good you are, you have to certify that as a result of this collaborative process, something has been improved. Um, the test for me, and I think in Albany, what we kept coming back to was the goal of all this is to increase public trust in the police and if possible, to make policing itself work better. And so as we thought through each of the different categories um, that we had to deal with, we tried to make that the guiding metric. So let me talk a little bit about Albany's experience. Um, Albany is a city of 100,000 people in a, a metro area of about a million. So it's a um, medium-sized city in a pretty big metro area, and um, that has all kinds of consequences for the tax base. But uh, Albany has a history of um, incidents involving um, police actions that led to significant community outcry, um, including very recent um, uh, incidents. And so there's a real uh, tension between the police and the community. Um, there's also a large community of activist engaged community organizations uh, that were there to be engaged with. And I think you know one of the challenges for some of the smaller municipalities I've spoken to that don't have a history of um, tension in the same way that Albany does, is that um, the community groups aren't there clamoring to be heard, so it's more challenging to find who participates in these collaboratives. You know, the, one of the really striking things about the governor's executive order is that it creates the same process for um, counties and for towns and villages and cities, despite the difference between and the differences within that category. I, I looked in the size of county um, law enforcement agencies ranges from, uh, I think the lowest was six sworn officers all the way up to about 2,500 sworn officers. So obviously the challenges between those different entities are going to be very different. Um, Albany comes in between 300 and 305. Um, and here's how we approached our planning process. So the mayor appointed about 40 people to this collaborative. It was a mix of um, local elected officials, the police department was represented in every working group, um, was very engaged with the process. Uh, we had members of the Common Council, we had the city auditor, we had um, staff from the mayor's office who were helping um, each of the working groups that we eventually broke into. Um, started meeting in November. Um, we've only just produced the draft report, which is now out for public comment and up on the website. Um, and in the interim, 
the the so-called collaborative um, I, I really prefer to call it a task force but collaborative is the word that people use um, broke up into working groups uh, and tried to divide them in the way that I think a number of municipalities have that is following the categories in the governor's guidance um, that document which is huge uh, you know more than 100 pages has some really useful headings in the table of contents so um, our working groups roughly followed the structure some uh, I know some municipalities have been even closer and just said all right four headings in the table of contents that means we're having a four working groups so the first one is on what functions should the police perform which means for example um, who's the first responder when you get a call to 911 about a person experiencing mental illness or homelessness um, who is going to be the first responder um, when there's a report of uh, an elderly confused person um, wandering around a neighborhood um, and uh, if those are not going to be functions performed by um, police officers who is going to perform them and where is that going to come from um, the second category is uh, policing standards and strategies which refers to I think really the whole range of police tactics uh, you know limits on things like chokeholds but also uh, community engagement strategies for um, for police forces that have things like a neighborhood engagement unit. Um, what is that unit doing and what could it do to be more effective? The third category um, is on culture and accountability, uh, which is a big category that, um, that includes uh, accountability, both internal and external accountability when there are allegations of misconduct what is the internal disciplinary process? Is there a disciplinary matrix that command staff use uh, to discipline um, police officers who they find have engaged in misconduct? Is there a, a community police review board? Um, we have one of these in Albany and actually my center staffs it so we have some experience. Um, civilian oversight is a very complicated and difficult business that doesn't always produce more community trust. Um, a, a civilian police review entity that is seen as ineffective um, can undermine community trust in police accountability. Uh, so it's important to think through how to do that and what it looks like. Uh, finally, uh, transparency is obviously a huge issue. Um, and um, we heard a little about 50A, I'm sure um, people are familiar with that, but there's a lot of implementation questions around 50A. Um, and that's just one aspect of uh, transparency. You know, we have litigation in, in a lot of municipalities about now that we know that police disciplinary records are subject to freedom of information law requests, um, does that mean all of them? Uh, we just got a Second Circuit decision um, last week that says that unsubstantiated complaints are subject to disclosure after the repeal of 50A. Um, I anticipate there will be further conversations um, about implementation in the wake of that Second Circuit decision, but it's a big deal. Um, but transparency isn't just disciplinary records, it's also transparency of data about policing. So um, here I think you know, the real question is, if you're a member of the community who is interested in how things work, and you wanna go online and see, does the data show that my police department is engaging in racial profiling or not engaging in racial profiling or if you're a journalist who's trying to find that information is that accessible you know realistically is the data that's being collected and distributed to the public sufficient um, to make that analysis meaningful um, and we had um, not as part of our process in albany but related to it we had an outside firm do an audit of the albany police department um, with a lot of focus on its data practices and they came back and said, the auditors came back and said, we just don't have enough data um, to, to tell you, you know, is, um, are people being stopped at traffic stops, for example, because of their race? Uh, there's just not enough data being collected. And so building towards what would it look like to collect enough data to answer that questions um, is a challenge and a resource challenge, as many of these things are. Finally, recruiting and supporting excellent personnel. Um, and there's really three big things under this fourth category in the governor's order. One is um, diversity and recruitment. Um, I, I, as far as I can remember, pretty much every police chief I've spoken to is concerned about um, how to improve diversity in their recruitment and looking for ideas on how to do that. It's a huge challenge. There are issues about the civil service law 
and whether changes need to be made to state law to facilitate um, uh, diverse recruitment. Um, there's a lot to think about there. There's also um, a second issue about training and education. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, are now familiar with the idea of implicit bias training. Um, there's ongoing scholarly research on implicit bias training and whether it's effective. There are other kinds of training like de-escalation training. Um, and, uh, you know, departments are continuing to explore what kind of training is necessary to build the police force in the way that we want to. Um, and finally, officer wellness and well-being, which I think um, needs to not be overlooked. There are um, extremely high rates of PTSD and um, other mental health issues among police officers. And, you know, creating a sustainable police force um, means making sure that officers are taken care of in the ways that they need to be. So um, we split up into working groups. Uh, each one had some co-chairs, had representation from community members, activist groups, um, elected officials, and each working group um, held public meetings where people could come and comment on the working group. There was a significant amount of controversy in Albany about who was in the collaborative and who was not in the collaborative. Um, folks who were excluded felt they should have been included, um, felt folks criticized the public outreach process for not being inclusive enough. Um, I spent many hours on Zoom calls uh, listening to public comment and did learn a lot from that process. Um, when we finally came back together to draft our recommendations, um, it's a very labor intensive process. You know, as we've been trying to look at um, draft reports that have come out statewide, uh, the Government Law Center has been posting links on our website. Um, I'll share that with Pat and if folks are interested, um, I'm happy to share that as well. As we identify plans, we put up links to them. They range in size from six or seven pages to um, 200 plus. You know, you've got a real, real variety in the content of these plans, what's going into them. Um, in Albany, it works out to be about 100 pages um, after all these public hearings. And now we're getting um, the Common Council, which is our local legislature, to have the hearings. And here's where we realize this process is not going to end on April 1st. So let me let me segue into just talking briefly about um, going forward. Uh, what we came up with and what most municipalities are com coming up with um, as a plan amounts to a bunch of policy recommendations. It's not draft legislative language. Right? It's not ready to be adopted by the policymakers. That's another step, and it's a big step um, because our recommendations are directed, some of them to the police force, some of them to the local legislature. There are also thoughts about things the state should maybe change. And so um, I was talking to Pat earlier about sort of low hanging fruit and high hanging fruit uh, in the process. What kinds of reforms are relatively easy to make and which ones are more challenging? And I think it's important to think about that as municipalities consider their plans for how to implement these recommendations. Some things can be implemented with relatively little um, institution change which makes them easier. One of our recommendations in Albany is all police department policies should be online and that should be required, um, just as a matter of sort of basic transparency. Now, it happens in Albany, that's an easy lift because the police department's already doing that. Uh, they started doing it about two months ago um, and I think it's a great step. So requiring it literally doesn't require anybody to do anything they're not doing already. It's just putting it into the law to make sure that it'll always stay that way and that people know that it's um, expected and required. Other things, you know, I think there's a sort of challenging irony in this process, which is that the governor's guidance has this first category of rethinking the role of police, right? Um, who's responding to 911? How are they doing it? There is, I think, um, more support for that um, idea of developing, for example, non-police first responders as a resource in your community. Um, there's a lot of support for that from police departments. Right, and from police officers who were never particularly excited about being called on to respond to situations that they don't feel adequately trained to respond to. So you know, this is an idea that has a lot of support um, from different quarters, but institutionally, um, it may require intermunicipal cooperation to achieve in the sense that, you know, um, where are the emergency responders who are not police going to come from? Um, it may take you know, working with the county. And we have seen some um, executive order collaboratives cooperating between counties and um, municipalities within the county uh, to develop ideas like this, which I think is fantastic. 
but obviously that kind of thing requires um, significant institutional movement, which makes it more challenging to implement. What I think is important um, is to be considering these issues as the plan goes into effect. You know, it's it's possible to just approve a plan and have it go on a shelf, and that's the last anybody hears about it. I do think from from um, last week and other conversations I've had with the governor's office, I do think that they're going to be reading these plans and watching the implementation to see what happens so that they can think about what needs to be done next. Um, and in terms of um, next steps, um, again, there are some significant things here that I think municipalities, um, counties, people at the local level can't resolve without state intervention. You know, reform ideas are much easier to come up with than to fund. I think that um, some things like um, better data accessibility, for example, realistically, what you're talking about is staff. And when you're talking about staff, you're talking about money. Um, and if the state doesn't contribute funding to municipalities, for example, um, to increase their data analysts so that data coming out of the police department can be made comprehensible, um, then it's probably not going to happen. Um, and so I think that part of this uh, 203 planning process should be the municipalities, the counties, letting people at the state know in their plans themselves, here's what we would need to make these reforms really happen. Um, I think it's entirely appropriate to include sections in the plan saying, here's where the state needs to jump in, either with funding um, or with changes to, to the law. Um, and so one of the last things I want to say um, is if you are, um, as many, many municipalities are thinking about accountability as part of this process, and it's a required thing to think about, right? It's in the governor's guidance. You're supposed to be thinking about it. Um, you're going to run into questions about what collective bargaining allows you to implement and what it doesn't. And right now, um, there is an incredibly confusing set of laws, statutes, and state court of appeals decisions on that question. Um, in the view of, of pretty much everybody I've spoken to about this issue, the state legislature needs to clarify it. Obviously, people have widely different views about what that clarification should be. Um, but I think unless the state legislature acts to clarify that law, um, we're going to continue to have municipalities really constrained from um, implementing, from moving forward. Um, not because they're prohibited, but because they don't know what they're allowed to do and what they're not. Um, and maybe they should be prohibited, but they shouldn't be confused. Um, so um, other things where the state, I think, um, needs to intervene um, include um, on uh, certification of, of police officers. There, there is a statewide database. Um, a firing for cause can lead to an officer being decertified and unable to find a new job. Uh, but that process isn't consistent and there are loopholes. I think the state should um, should clarify that. And you know, I also think that there are a number of areas that are under consideration in the executive order where um, you know, if you're a municipality with a five officer police force, you shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel and decide which use of force tactics are appropriate and which aren't without at the very least state guidance for best practices or a menu of options to choose from in the state. I'm not sure there's any good reason why you know, a small rural municipality should have different use of force standards um, than a big urban municipality. Maybe they should, but at the very least, um, there's been a lot of duplicative resource expenditure on this process for people just to find out what are the reports out there? What's the research out there? What are the best practices? Um, I think the state and DCJS could do a lot more to support that process in the future. And now that community municipalities are really engaged with this issue, we've seen a real need for that. Um, okay, the last thing I'll say is that if there's anything that I would call the most important element of these plans, it's a mechanism for continuing the conversation after April 1st. Right? The, the idea behind Executive Order 203, I think, is a good idea that the community should be engaged in thinking about policing and how it works. And um, some communities already have institutions that are designed to accommodate that. In Albany, we have the Community Police Review Board, which is a community body that has the power to make policy recommendations, to engage in policy dialogue with police. Um, so we have that, and we're lucky that we have that. Uh, some municipalities don't have a structure like that, whether it's an advisory council of some kind, 
um, whether it's uh, a police review board, whether it's a committee of the local legislature that's charged with thinking about this, um, the community needs to be involved in thinking about policing policy if trust is going to be achieved. And I think um, these plans can do a great service by thinking about, you know, is it um, some municipalities have a task force on racial equity, not limited to policing. Um, I think that can be a great mechanism, again, for continuing the conversation. So um, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm happy to be useful to anyone uh, in any way I can. Um, you can get my email address easily from, from the website. Um, and um, I look forward to hearing from my co-panelists. Thanks again to Pat, to Steve Aquero, to everybody um, for making this panel happen. Thanks so much, Ava. Um, and, and I think Ava's got to uh, jump off. I think uh, she's, got to, she's got another meeting uh, shortly. And I know you've got a few questions for I will definitely send those on uh, to, to Ava, and then we'll, we'll get a response for everyone without any specific questions for what uh, Ava presented. So thanks again um, for, for joining us, uh, Ava. And now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, turn the turn the floor over to New York City and, and our panel of experts, to uh, Ariana, Liz, and Marcos. Thanks so much for being here. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, uh, Pat. Thank you, Eva, Carly, for your um, your sharing. And I think we want to just reiterate and, and start off by saying, in New York City, uh, we've very much approached this process as thinking of it as iterative and ongoing, and recognizing that all of the reforms of the past are building. We're building on them, and then we hope to see um, the next administration to pick up and continue the process. Uh, into the future. So I'm just going to start off by sharing a little bit of how New York City is uh, envisioning our um, and how we've approached our process. And then I'll hand it over to my colleagues to discuss um, from their perspectives as well. Um, so first and foremost, New York City um, and uh, Jeanette, if you want to move along on the slides, um, we are approaching it with the vision that our reinvention collaborative is uh, staying true to our history and the of the bravery and the service to the public that the NYPD um, stands for, but that we we are aiming to maintain a stellar record of driving down crime while continuing to transform and be transparent, have accountable policing, implement an equitable uh, process and system without regard to race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, immigration, or socioeconomic status. And we use that vision in, as guiding principles as we move through our process. Um, Jenna, you can actually click uh, two slides ahead, please. So as a part of our process where we use these main um, framework uh, principles to, to drive the work we've done and the engagements we've done across our community. Um, of course, I guess I'd be remiss in not saying, of course, New York City is a city of eight and a half million people and a police force uh, of over 36,000. So we, we recognize that um, the magnitude and the responsibility that it is to, to talk about policing within our city is immense. Um, so we're focused on figuring out how to strengthen accountability, oversight, and discipline. We're focused on trust, and I know that word's come up a lot today. It's a, a cornerstone for New York City, thinking about it as um, through fairness and through how we can work with through our neighborhood partnerships and to have representation from a diverse number of communities. We've thought about engaging um, both our community partners, but also our police partners and our members of service. We've talked about training, how we can eliminate bias, how we can expand the knowledge of our, our force, and how we can change the experience of both our community and our, our force. Um, we've worked to redefine how we respond to issues of both poverty and mental illness, and how we really rethink the role of police in the community. Um, and most importantly, how we can support, support a diverse, resilient, and um, holistic NYPD. Uh, you can move forward, Jeanette. And so we've built upon a structure, I think it was mentioned at the beginning, that this is really a collaborative. Um, our, the mayor, as the um, chief elected official, heads up the, the collaborative, and we, we work alongside our intergovernmental affairs unit, our law department, our council's office, our community affairs unit, the NYPD, the Office of Operations, the City Council, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. And most importantly, we um, asked our, to have some 
key community leaders join us in this process and we consider them our co-sponsors of the work we're doing. Um, so in New York City, they are Jennifer Jones Austin, um, who heads up the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, Arva Rice of the New York Urban League, and Wes Moore of the Robert Hood Foundation. So their role is really to help ad, act as advisors um, to help us to think about, are we reaching the right portions of the community, but also um, as we evaluate pr uh, proposals, um, do, they're helping us to take a temperature check on um, making sure that they feel as though we're considering the right proposals as well. Um, Jeanette, you can move forward. And so throughout that process, we've had significant amount of community engagement. Um, and Marcos is going to, he is not my double, um, he, Marcos Soler is going to talk us through um, that uh, community engagement and how we've thought about really reaching um, as many New Yorkers as possible throughout our process. Actually, Elizabeth Liz is going to talk about that, and so I'll sorry. do the other no, no, go, go, go ahead, Liz, please. Thank, thanks so much to both of you, and uh, thanks to, to Carly and to Ava. I really appreciated their um, incredible focus on process. I'm a process person myself, so um, happy to talk about our engagement strategy and just starting with the basic principles that I think we realized at the outset of this process that you know, policing fails when it is something that we do to people instead of with them. And reform fails if it's something that we do to cops instead of with them. So the heart of our engagement strategy was really bringing people together and maximizing the opportunities for community participation. So what we did was we hosted nine town hall style listening sessions. The first eight were geographic, so one in Manhattan North, one in Manhattan South, uh, et cetera, throughout the five boroughs um, that were open to the public. They were uh, live streamed on Facebook Live uh, and also uh, people were able to register via Zoom. We did those meetings with a brief presentation about the state of the NYPD, the police commissioner or the first deputy commissioner participated in each one. And we just did an open town hall, town hall style forum. The ninth one of those meetings, we actually broadcast simultaneously in 10 different languages because we wanted to make sure to reach our limited English proficiency community as well. Um, the, the second phase of engagement was more tailored um, where we hosted approximately 70 or so uh, stakeholder roundtable meetings. And when I say we hosted, it's important to note that the NYPD is a member of this collaborative, but they were really hosted by the collaborative. So we rotated sort of who the facilitator was at, at each of those engagements and were often joined by uh, other city government entities, such as the Mayor's Office for Persons with Disabilities and the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs and the Department of uh, Youth and, and Children's Services. So great partners throughout the city really worked together to um, organize and facilitate this additional 70 or so meetings and I'll talk a little bit, um, if we can go to the next slide, about who participated. Liz, we've we've lost your audio. So we. Because we cannot hear Liz, let me address that as I was part of many of those meetings. A, most of those a listening sessions. And different um, volunteers to uh, bring in the voice of our, of our officers. Um, we also met with our oversight agencies. The NYPD has five, at least five different oversight bodies, um, including the Civilian Complaint Review Board. We're under a federal monitorship right now. Um, the Department of Investigation, district attorneys, et cetera. And we actually uh, got some great help from CCRB in hosting their own town halls as part of this process, which really brought a very uh, youth-centered voice um, into the process, which, which was great. Um, we've obviously engaged, engaged with elected officials at all level, levels um, and tapped into many of their constituencies as well. We can go to the next slide. Liz, your audio went out for just one moment. So I think the piece that um, everyone missed was when you talked about engaging 
um, internally within the NYPD and how critical it was to make sure that we were bringing in both our leadership, not just of our unions, which we did, but also bringing in the heads of the fraternal organizations um, to make sure that we were hearing from as many diverse voices as possible. We also asked vol uh, volunteers from the department to come in and share feedback. Um, in addition to that, we asked um, people who are on duty to come in off and, and actually give feedback so um, that they were their input was solicited um, both in a um, official on duty capacity as well as by volunteer. And I think um, I don't want to preempt what you may say here, Liz, but one of the things that we've we've often talked about and recognized is that in many of the listening sessions, and please elaborate, um, we heard a lot from the officers that they cared very much about similar things that the community did, that it was really critical to have training, to build relationships amongst the community that they were policing. And so that that's a, a really key consideration as we move forward. And I'll leave it to you to elaborate. Um, Thanks, Ari. I'm sorry for the tech fail there. Um, I, I, Ari is 100% right. Um, one of my favorite words is consensus. I am so heartened in this process by the alignment between the needs of our officers and the needs of the community and the vision that they share for public safety. Um, in general, our officers are looking for greater transparency and consistency and fairness in the disciplinary system, which is certainly something that we heard repeatedly from the community as well. Um, they are concerned about the role of the police. Um, really, what is their job? And, and if we're failing in homelessness and we're failing in education and we're failing in housing and we're facing all of these challenges, the, the young man or woman who puts on the uniform every day becomes the face um, of, of all of that when they respond to a call for service and, and police officers will be the first to tell you that they don't always feel that they are best equipped um, to deal with the situation that they are encountering when it is not one that really poses a, a public safety threat. Um, so we've definitely uh, heard a lot in that space and, and done a lot in that space. Um, but again, I think from us, uh, we were just we're really pleased to see uh, a lot of uh, alignment and consensus across constituencies. And we really uh, just met with a, an incredible cross-section of people. I think to Ava's point earlier, um, we avoided some of the controversy around who was considered a member of the collaborative by maximizing our community engagement and outreach. So anyone who wanted to participate in the collaborative process was invited in to participate in the collaborative process. Um, and that included CBOs, advocacy groups, clergy leaders, racial justice advocates, people with disabilities, um, the full, you know, this is not even a comprehensive list in the slide and it's, it's pretty robust. And I think a key takeaway for us here is that we are gonna continue this engagement. This engagement does not stop with the publication of the reform plan. And I think it's really shown us as an agency how much value there is in having some structure around uh, community conversations and these con a continuing dialogue that extends beyond um, the time parameters associated with Executive Order 203. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to pause there and turn to Marcos, who, again, I said earlier, I'm the, I'm the process person. Marcos is a policy expert, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, some of the reforms that uh, the NYPD and the city of New York have enacted really over the last seven years um, and where we're going. So, Marcos, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Nessa Slide. So I want to start with a saying that the reforms that we are building, as I think in many other jurisdictions, are building upon a past. The history of reform and police reform is not a new thing. It started 100 years ago in the police department, and we have had many iterations of this process. Certainly, in, during this administration, we have had accelerated and implemented many of these reforms, introducing the concept of precision policing as, as a different philosophy and approach to policing neighborhood policing, emphasizing community-based approach to policing, and the stop and freeze, implemented body board cameras, reduce misdemeanor enforcement substantially, and enact a, a lot of summons reforms, and many other reforms that a, we will be reporting in our document, in our report to be released soon. That actually is also driven not only by strategies and specific policy um, programs, 
but also very concrete facts, right? We have reduced a overall arrest by 68% under the administration. We have reduced misdemeanor arrest by 70%. We have reduced a marijuana arrest by 96%. We have reduced criminal summons by 87%. Reduced the summons freeze by 95%. We have reduced the number of people incarcerated by 54%. We have also in, in, in our city jails. And we also have done all of that with a lot of restraint on the use of force, for instance, adversarial conflicts uh, resulting in the dis firearm discharge are down from 72 point per million be before this administration to 2.9 uh, under this administration. So those are all metrics that we are following to track the progress that we have made in our reforms, progress that we are making. But certainly we are not enough there. We think this is why we are engaging with the plan and we are doing it both in a dark consistent way of looking at processes, but also looking at very concrete evidence-driven strategies that might bring about reform. So the mayor has announced some of the things that I will be talking about here, plus what are, you know additional items that might come to this reform process. For instance, the city has, has adopted the disciplinary matrix and an MOU, not just a disciplinary matrix, which is common in very, many jurisdictions, but an MOU between the CCRB and the police department to make sure that there is consistent a penalty guidelines so that provides certain guarantees, obviously, not just for the civilians who file these complaints and for the people who work through the process, but also quite important, I think Elizabeth was indicating, some sort of predictability and clear due process for the officers would not to respect. There is no better way to determine misconduct than to send a clear message about what is to be expected and officers trusting the process as well as the civilians. By the same way, we are going to strengthen the Civilian Complaint Review Board, our oversight agency. And one of the ways in which we are going to do that is we are going to span, obviously, a lot of the access and investigative call and they have, if we are gonna review their powers, we are in that process right now, but we are going to do very concrete things. We are gonna allow the CCRB to self-initiate investigations. Until now, it was reactive to civilians bringing about complaints. We want to give the CCB the opportunity to start some of these complaints. We want to give full access to the entire disciplinary officer history. We want to make sure that they can a, a start investigations of bias-based called policing complaints, etc. We want them to give the power to review police guidelines. And equally important, what we are thinking is we have a model in New York where we have three different entities conducting different type of reviews. The CCB was conducting a traditional investigation, investigatory role, investigating complaints. We have the Commission to Combat Police Corruption that was auditing many of, the, 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 uh, of those investigations and the disciplinary process. And we have the Inspector General making recommendations on overall police reforms. And certainly we want to integrate all these strategies to make a more robust CCRB complaint. Next slide, please. A, the other thing we want to announce is we think public safety needs to be co-produced with the community. This is no longer the role of law enforcement. One of the central items of the reform is what is the role of law enforcement? Certainly, police department have a crucial role to play in crime control, particularly addressing gun violence and addressing violent crime. We have seen experience in the last year, certainly the impact of gun violence, not just in New York City, but across the state and certainly across the nation. Police department has a central role here. And, but we also want to do that with the community. For the, from the beginning of the administration, the administration has invested very seriously in cure violence initiatives. We have only two or three sites prior to the administration. Right now we have 29 sites operating in 20 precincts, almost two thirds, sorry, one third of the city. We want to continue to do that. In order to do that, we are doubling cure violence. We are launching this joint force to end gun violence where we are going to do citywide shooting reviews, where we are going to do contact tracing for each shooting, but we are going to understand more the root causes of violence. We also want to make sure that communities have a key role. And this is something that they brought up in many of our listening sessions in the evaluation and selection of prison commanders. People in the community want to know that the commander in charge of that prison is going to be responsive. And certainly we think that this is going to bring greater accountability to the process. A, certainly a 
we have talked before and Ava mentioned that the importance about transparency on the data side, I have given you some of the statistics from which we started and to evaluate all these process. We certainly want to elevate a CAMSAT. CAMSAT is well known, I don't need to refer here to how it has been implemented across many jurisdictions. It's an, a strategy, it's not just a tool, it's a strategy of policing, but we also think it's important to incorporate community feedback, input into how the community feels is going on. And finally, we want to also bring clear community engagement into policy uh, making and training. So we are gonna expand the police pe academy, people's Acad the People's Police Academy, and provide additional cultural training to officers in the precinct. Officers are already receiving the escalation, is, uh, take the, uh, the escalation training, implicit bias training, all forms of training, uh, CR, uh, press intervention training. This is just going to emphasize their ability to uh, go to a precinct and to incorporate. Just a decade ago, we just, uh, the city just used to float the, the, a particular new pre, you know, a, a, a precinct with new officers. What we want to do is make sure that those officers not just go to a city, to a precinct, but they are fully integrated into the structure of that, uh, of that precinct. Those are some of the things that we'll be implementing in, and we have already announced. And certainly our report uh, will continue to expand on possibilities for additional opportunities for reform. Thank you. And certainly we're, we're happy to take any questions as part of the Q&A, but I would just like to wrap up and say, um, you know, as Jack mentioned in the beginning, I've been honored to serve as Mayor de Blasio's board representative for NISAC, and we really value the relationship we have with all of the counties, and we understand that with this, the size of New York City, we may have resources that others don't, but we certainly also appreciate that that doesn't mean that there aren't things happening in other communities that maybe New York City hasn't contemplated or that we can implement because we can learn lessons from each other. So we just want to conclude by saying we, we'd love to communicate with anybody who's interested and Pat can certainly um, put anybody in touch with me and I am happy to facilitate a further and deeper discussion with um, both Marcos and, and Liz from here. Thanks Ariana and uh, yeah, we'll definitely definitely take you up on that. Um, uh, we, we appreciate what a great presentation that was. And from all our speakers, Liz, uh, Marcos, thanks so much. If, if everyone's got a few minutes, we, def we got some questions that came in. Um, well, the first one that came in, uh, but, but anyone feel free to jump in with this one. When, when Carly, when you're speaking about the process, I got a, a process and general powers question. It says, uh, you know, dur during this, this um, adoption, are there, uh, are there limits on the county legislative action uh, regarding the plans, meaning may a county legislature, in your opinion, amend the plan prior to adoption? I think so, uh, Pat, but, you know, it, that will be very complicated because I think there could be issues related to uh, the public comments. So I've been a little bit nervous about people's timing in terms of bringing these to the ledge because arguably if the ledge has not been included in the process to date and isn't aware of the steps um, or been part of the different task force collaborative, uh, then they might have questions, um, they might want to review data, they might want to make amendments to the plan. And if they do, I believe that those would have to be you know, brought back for additional public comment, particularly if those were um, large amendments to the plan. So I think there isn't, you know, the process is linear as it's written in the executive order, but I believe um, that if the ledge has different types of amendments, uh, I would be concerned about uh, changes to the plan, especially when the task force have been more involved with data and other types of things. So I think that's a great question. Um, I don't think there's any limits that are listed, but I think the process itself has created limits in as much as we're clear that there has to be public comment on the plan. And if there's an amendment that substantially modified something that was developed by the task force and then reviewed by the public, I think you might need to look into uh, rebooting at least in part your process. Thanks, Carly. Uh, we've got a question in um, 
from uh, uh, some counties looking to to add to their plans potentially um, special non-police mental health response units. Um, wondering from from our experts, have have you seen any plans that have that have um, looked to do something like this? And and if so, do you think it's logistically possible? Um, for a county or city to, to do something like this um, in, the, in the near future. And Marcos and Liz can elaborate, but um, certainly in New York City, we talked about and actually launched a partnership. Um, just yesterday, Mayor de Blasio announced that uh, we'll be doing a pilot in New York City about a um, civilian response to as many mental health initiatives as possible. So we're happy to get folks some details on that recent announcement. Um, Marcos, Liz, I don't know if you have any specifics that you would want to elaborate, but we, we can share what's already public with, with you, Pat, and you can um, share that with others as well. That'd be great, thank you. And certainly I, I would be remiss if I didn't um, share with others. Um, in New York City, we have an initiative called Thrive NYC. Um, which is focused on mental health response across all disciplines. And we have a substantial number of resources that we'd be happy to lend to anybody and share some of that expertise. For those that are interested, um, again, just let Pat know and we, we'll connect you with our, our Thrive team to talk about their role in integrating into our broader um, policy. In fact, Thrive is now led by our former Deputy Commissioner of Collaborative Policing. And so we really understand that there is a mental health and police connection there. Um, as Mayor de Blasio said yesterday, we will do our very best to make sure that non-public um, safety incidents are, are handled by a civilian response, but we're, we're piloting that program and intend to really evaluate it to make sure that we, we consider public safety needs as well. Thanks, Ari. Um, and the, the, here, here's a, 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 another one that I, I've, um, uh, dealing with with on hiring um, of, of police officers, uh, you know, currently and going forward. Um, any recommendations for our counties on? Um, I know uh, Ava mentioned and New York City mentioned the the, the, the importance of, of diversity and the steps we've made um, to get more diversity. They, the, this questions um, also though is, is there uh, ways to strengthen uh, or ideas the screening process to make sure that uh, to, to guard against either ex, uh, extremist uh, views that may be looking uh, from people or, or, or even um, people that might be potentially dangerous becoming police officers. Uh, how, how can we improve our screening process? Um, can I say something about that? Yeah. So, and um. With with many apologies, then I have to go. I have a faculty meeting that I'm I'm uh, overdue for. But one idea um, from Schenectady, the city of Schenectady in upstate New York, is to involve members of the community in interviewing um, candidates for police officer hiring. So, um, you know, there are different structures that you could use depending on uh, your community's governance structure. But um, the idea was that if you know members of the community could have a conversation with officers before they came on board. Um, and obviously there's all sorts of procedural things that need to be worked out for that to make sense, um, but at least Schenectady and I think other jurisdictions are considering that. So that's just one thought. Um, and let me just say thank you. I, I apologize for having to leave, but I'm so grateful again to my co-panelists and to the Association of Counties. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Ava. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have one, one more question. And, and again, I know there's there's a lot here. Uh, send your questions into to NISAC. Um, we, we work with, with all these experts on a regular basis. We will get back to you on these. Um, but the, we want to make sure this this one more, I think is, is really important that we answer. And that's um, the county wants to make sure that they are, um, you know, we, we use the word community a lot and involving the community. But um, how how do we know exactly what that definition is what are we reach how how what's the best way we we can say that we are reaching out to the community and uh know that we've gotten uh at least notice and everything to everyone involved that we want to bring at the table to the table
Elizabeth, do you want to take that one or you want me to go? Sure. I think, you know, for us in terms of who we wanted to engage with, like I said, we, we wanted to make sure that every individual voice had an opportunity to be heard. And what we focused on was communities most impacted by policing. Um, so in order to elevate the voices of the, those communities that were most impacted by policing, we looked at some data about incarceration rates and shooting incidents and uh, citizen complaints against officers by population to narrow down the areas of New York City, which we kind of termed these impacted communities. Um, we held open meetings for anyone who wanted to speak in those communities, but also targeted advocacy groups and organizations within those same communities um, to try and develop uh, more of a dialogue, um, you know, with people who aren't always the loudest voices, but might have the most to say, if that makes sense. Um, so I would say that that was really a key part of our engagement strategy. And, and every meeting that we had with a stakeholder group, we ended with who else should we talk to um and we ended up you know getting the the list keep growing kept growing and we just kept having those conversations so um we got great referrals from uh, you know from and to people who i think wouldn't normally have any engagement with law enforcement um so beyond just criminal justice advocates and folks in the criminal justice system just key community leaders who are very active in ensuring um, that their neighborhoods are, are safe and that their schools are you know, safe and that uh, their businesses are thriving and that their commutes are safe um, are folks that we sort of gained connectivity to through asking that key question, who else should we meet with? If I may also, one of the things and strategy that we have used in New York City and particularly driven by my office is using against the model of Compton, we implemented neighborhood stat the neighborhood is that brings the opportunity to bring multiple agencies, not just the police department, to address with citizens directly a, what is their conception and their understanding of public safety, what are their priorities, to hear from them, to provide annual planning for what are the priorities and to hear their concerns directly, not just obviously about public safety and crime, but also which ways a community thinks a neighborhoods can be a police better. And we think that is important to create an structure, permanent structures that allow residents to communicate to government as a whole, not just simply a police department, to get that feedback. And obviously, to use, as we said, data, trans any form of data transparency in order to incorporate people's feedback into the way we operate. At the end of the day, police department is just a part of the operations of general government. And what we know is it's important because it's the first way in which we connect with government. But trust, trust has to be across the board, not just in the police department, but with all the government entities. And we government officials can do much more to bring up together the community to give us our input. I mean, to give it their input, sorry, so we can incorporate into our operations. And if I can just add briefly to that, I think one of the other premises that was unique is really building that trust within the community to say, as I think was a common theme today, making this an iterative process and continuing on the conversation past just the adoption of a 203 plan in April 1, as we can integrate the, the widespread community engagement in all different um, capacities, we build that trust with the community in a, in a whole new way that helps us to say and continue to evolve that this is a two-way street and it, it really is an opportunity for uh, the police and the community to work together to to really build um, the society that we all want. So I, I think that commitment to an ongoing process is also a cornerstone to measuring our own success. Thanks so much. Uh, that, that that was uh, all great information. That this 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 whole webinar um, and the and the Q and A. I mean, uh, any webinar is only as as good as its speakers, and this was as good as it gets. So thank you again for your time. Um, a reminder to all our uh, NYSEC members that this this webinar, if your um, uh, county colleagues did not get a chance to see this, we'll have this up on our web. So we please encourage you to share that. Encourage you to keep sending along questions so we can help. Uh, you know, uh, all the way up until April 1st, and as Ari just mentioned, beyond April 1st to keep keep working on this issue. 
Um, on behalf of the NICE Act Executive Director, Stephen Aquario, and our President, Jack Marin, and a special thank you to our great speakers um, and our members for joining us on this important topic. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll, we'll all see you soon at, uh, for the rest of the webinars this week at NISAC.